the rest of the day. Um, we have four talks lined up for this afternoon, and then we'll conclude the day with um, a panel discussion and then dinner over at uh, Free House, which is just a five minute walk from the Simons Institute. So um, I'm delighted to introduce our first speaker of the afternoon, Davide Riso. He is an associate professor of statistical sciences at the University of Padua. And he will talk to us about the work that his group has been doing on gene association networks based on single cell RNA-seqs. Thanks very much, Davide. Thank you, Sandrine, for the invitation and the kind introduction. Um, so if it's fine for everybody, I'll keep my mask off so it's easier um, to, to follow my uh, talk. So um, I just uh, um, thought that uh, I'll spend a couple of slides introducing uh, single cell RNA-seq, just because um, you know, uh, everybody was sort of like diving into the topic with no <laughs> introduction. I'm sure many of you know already, but like just uh, so that we are on, on the same page. The idea is that if we have a complex organ like the brain in, in Hagen case, um, uh, we could until, you know, maybe 10 years ago or so, we could only do like bulk RNA-seq, right? We could just take the a piece of organ, just chop it up and just uh, uh, measure the gene expression average gene expression across all the uh, different cell types. Um, nowadays, we have these single cell RNA-seq protocols where basically we can uh, characterize the RNA profiles of each individual cell. And then we can do the, something like bioinformatically, like clustering the different cell types and then measuring sort of cell type specific expression um, of genes or isoforms uh, in these cases. And as you can imagine, this opens up a lot of different questions. So what are uh, cell type specific markers? or um, sort of like, is there uh, disease associated uh, cell types or cell states? And uh, whether we can do like some, uh, some sort of like uh, comparison between different tissues, but uh, at a cell type uh, specific way. So um, the, uh, I guess the first part of my introduction is about count models for RNA-seq data, because this data in the case of RNA sequencing is essentially um, uh, counts in the sense that we map reads to, to genes, and then we can essentially count how many reads we have. And that's our estimate of gene expression. And you can sort of imagine this in a very simplistic way as a simple random sampling of the reads across the genome, in this case, across you know, the expressed exons. And if we do that, essentially what we can, uh, the way we can model these data is as a, a binomial process, which we have some total number of uh, reads for our, our sample. And then basically the probability of uh, observing a read from our gene is essentially the true expression of the gene and uh, uh, proportional to the uh, length of that gene. And since we have many, many reads and many, many genes, so this uh, individual PJ is quite small, we can actually um, approximate that very well with the Poisson process, right? And that's you know the most simplistic way you can think about these data. Um, except that when you look at real data sets and you, you do something like this, where every point is a gene, and you have the mean expression level and the, and the variance uh, for each gene, uh, you see that by a Poisson model, you would expect uh, sort of this equivariance um, uh, situation. And you have uh, sort of like this over dispersion that you observe in the data. So this is mainly due to biological variability across your samples. Uh, but it means that the Poisson is probably not um, a good model for many of these genes. And so people have introduced this negative binomial distribution as a, as a way, as a very simple way of, um, of dealing with this over dispersion. Um, this is the formula of the negative binomial that's not very important. What is important is that um, it, it basically characterizes the variance of your counts as uh, a quadratic function of the mean. And uh, this is you know, what the classic sort of differential expression um, uh, papers um, uh, do, they assume this distribution. And uh, it's also uh, a sort of like a special case of this distribution is the Poisson when the dispersion parameter um, uh, tends to zero. The uh, good thing about this model is that it's, it's, it's kind of simple computationally, and it's also very good in terms of interpretation in the sense that you can in, sort of imagine that the variance is split in two components, one that can kind of represents the technical component. So if you increase your, your mean, you increase the number of reads that sort of tends to go to zero, but then you have sort of like a, a fixed uh, parameter that is sort of like biological uh, variability. It's not really dependent on, on, the, um, on the sequencing technology. And um, this is all fine for bulk RNA-seq where you have sort of, uh, if you have two technical replicates of a typical bulk RNA-seq sample, you see that most genes sort of like line up across the diagonal, 
meaning that all of these sort of uh, technical variability can be uh, represented by the Poisson. And then on top of that, you have the biological variability that uh, is well captured by the negative binomial. When you look at single cell level, even with, rep with a technical replicates, you see that you have much more variability and also a lot more zeros um, in the data, right? So these are, for example, all genes that are zero in replicate two, but are kind of like expressed uh, at a high number of reads in uh, uh, replicate one and the same here for replicate two. So um, uh, what people, us and other people have sort of uh, tried to do in this, with this data is think about uh, how to kind of model this extra zero that we see in the data. And uh, one way to do that is to use the zero inflated negative binomial, like uh, Jesse was showing uh, earlier, that essentially puts an extra um, probability of observing the zero uh, in addition to the typical uh, distribution of a negative binomial uh, proportion of zeros. And uh, essentially you can, you can uh, interpret this parameter pi as the sort of prior probability that the zero is observed instead of your uh, sort of count, uh, read count, uh, typical of a negative binomial distribution. So this is, um, we're, we're gonna get back to this in a, in a few slides to see what is the actual uh, sort of uh, uh, reasonable model to, to model single cell RNA-seq data. But this is quite a general model in the sense that uh, for pi equal to um, zero, it essentially boils down to the negative binomial distribution. And again, when in this case, I'm sorry, I'm using a slightly different notation, but with this theta parameter, um, uh, a special case of this or a limiting case of this would be the Poisson. So you can kind of recover all of the different uh, distribution Poisson, negative binomial, zero inflated Poisson and zero inflated negative binomial with this sort of uh, general model. So the problem is that in a lot of these differential expression papers, uh, what they do, they, they model each gene independently, right? Then they use some kind of like maybe uh, empirical based approach to kind of uh, be more robust to this uh, sort of assumption. But like uh, essentially, all that uh, it relates to the dependency structure of the data is sort of thrown away. Um, and you know, a good exception is you know, Jessica's model that actually tries to model that with a copula, right? But like I would say that 90% of at least the bulk RNA-seq papers, they sort of like make this uh, uh, gene independence assumption. And, and that's what we want to kind of like um, uh, uh, sort of uh, overcome. Right? And there are obviously many, many different ways in which you can account for these sort of uh, dependencies across genes. And uh, one of them is uh, these sort of uh, graphical models uh, approach. So I guess my second introduction is uh, a little bit of an introduction on this general class of models, which uh, are called graphical models. So the idea of graphical models really sort of like boils down to the idea of conditional independence um, in the sense that if you imagine to have three random variables, x1, x2, and x3, you can sort of define um, this idea of conditional independence in, in this sort of equation um, is read in, in this way. X1 is conditionally independent on, of X3 um, given X2. And this essentially means that if we have some sort of, you know, law distribution, likelihood, whatever you want to call it, of X1 given X2 and X3, this is exactly equal to the distribution of X1 given X2. And in you know, other words, uh, essentially knowing X2 renders X3 completely irrelevant in trying to explain or predict X1, right? So this um, is nice in my opinion for a few different ways. And first of all, it's kind of uh, intuitive to think about gene independences in this kind of way. So maybe there's a, um, uh, there's, there's a nice uh, sort of interpretation of this in the context of gene expression, but it's also a very nice computational tool in the sense that you know, if we want to characterize the joint distribution of you know, three random variables, x1, x2, x3, because of this assumption, now we can essentially uh, sort of uh, factorize the distribution in two components, right? For example, um, in, in various ways, for example, um, looking at a bivariate distribution of x1, x2, and then um, the uh, distribution of x3 given x2, right? So, so essentially we're taking a, a, a three dimensional sort of problem and we're, and we're uh, reducing it to a two dimensional problem, which uh, is nice from a, a computational point of view too. So um, the uh, nice thing is about graphical models is that these uh, conditional independencies can be sort of represented with graphs. And, uh, and this, I think it's a very good feature because, you know, in some sense, networks and graphs are a, a sort of common language between statisticians and biologists, right? Biologists are very used to graphs and, and sort of like networks, and they have an intuitive uh, understanding of, of those as well, even 
uh, without thinking about uh, conditional independences in this case. So this uh, relation that I was looking at before, x1 is in conditional independent on x3 given x2, can be represented with this very simple graph. And in this sense, uh, you know, you have an edge between the nodes if there isn't a conditional independence. So because x1 and x2 are not conditionally independent, then you have an edge. Uh, in this case, the only missing edge is one and three uh, because we have this uh, conditional independence um, uh, statement. Okay, and so this um, going back to the to the uh, sort of uh, factorization of the likelihood um, can be seen in terms of clicks in the graph, which is also a nice uh, sort of feature. So, for example, you can take um, you know this uh, um, uh, one two which would be a click in our, in our graph and, and sort of like take the, the joint distribution of these two variables and then take this uh, condition on the, on, the, on the only one that is connected to three in this case, which is two. Or you could do the other way around with this uh, sort of factorization. So um, the, the, what, what I'm essentially explained is what people in statistics call probabilistic graphical model. And just to be a little more formal in the definition, a probabilistic graphical model is essentially defined as a pair. Uh, the pair is like the two components of the pair are the graph G, which is the usual sort of definition of a graph, a set of vertices B and a set of edges E. And then you have on top of that, a certain family of distribution F, which uh, represents essentially the probability distributions of the nodes on the, on the graph. And as I said, essentially, uh, if you have like uh, an edge S between the nodes S and T in your set of edges E, uh, that um, uh, essentially implies the conditional independence between, sorry, sorry the absence of the edge um, implies the uh, conditional independence between the two nodes S and T, given uh, everything else, uh, all the other nodes. So um, this is sort of like actually an assumption that we need to make in the, in the graph, which is um, uh, sometimes called the uh, faithfulness assumption, meaning that we can read off all of these conditional distributions from the graph only. And uh, you know, these are sort of like a, a, a very simple example of a graph, just to give you an idea of what these uh, properties of the graph are, which are called the Markov properties. Um, so we have sort of the uh, global Markov property, uh, which is this one, which essentially says that you know two sets of nodes are conditionally independent of each other, given sort of a separator of the graph. So if you kind of separate these two sets of nodes, in this case one uh, against three and four, uh, the separator is essentially just a set of nodes that interrupts the path between the two sets, right? And so in this case, you have that one is conditionally independent of three and four, given two and five. This is sort of like the global uh, Markov property. And then we have also the local Markov property. So for example, um, uh, the, the global Markov property says that, you know, if we focus, for example, on gene five or, you know, node five and node three, these two are independent given all of its neighbors, right? So basically five is conditionally independent to three, um, conditioned on two and four, because essentially every path that goes from five to three has to go through either four or two, okay? And then we have the pairwise uh, Markov property, which essentially says that for any kind of uh, uh, set of nodes, like pair of nodes, like in this case, one and five, they are conditionally independent on the rest of the graph. Um, so if you, if you if one and five are conditionally independent, conditioned on the rest of, or rest of the graph. A very good thing about these sort of uh, Markov properties is that if you have a certain set of conditions, which is essentially true for all uh, you know, reasonable uh, probability distributions, these three are equivalent. Okay, so um, you can sort of like uh, look at the graph and infer all of these properties um, of conditional independences just looking at the graph. So, we, you know, we're not the first ones to think about applying this sort of graphical models framework to gene expression. This was done by um, a lot of people, actually. I'm citing just a couple, uh, but just to say that uh, there are essentially two possible ways that you can think about applying these graphical models to gene expression data. One is just to inform, better inform your differential expression model, okay? So you're saying like, I want to compare, for example, condition A versus condition B. Uh, instead of doing it like independently gene by gene, I can take, for example, a, a cap pathway, transform that into a graph, um, and then basically saying, okay, I'm, I'm, instead of testing one gene at a time, I'm now just testing one pathway at a time using the multivariate distribution of the genes in the pathway. And this was done uh, in a couple of papers, one by Sandrine um, uh, actually a few years ago. And um, 
The other thing, which is the focus on this talk, is actually structure learning. Stru try to learn the structure of the graph. So this kind of a set of conditional independencies starting from the data. And the idea here is that you have your matrix of gene expression, and you want to try sort of to um, uh, estimate some kind of graph that represents sort of the, the structure and the association between these genes. So uh, just to get to the, to the core of the uh, talk, um, what we do is that uh, we uh, take a sort of a node conditional approach. So we specified the distribution of the node condition on all the other nodes. And this is, uh, we assume that this is a, a zero inflated negative binomial distribution. And as I said before, this is not really a statement on whether we think that the data are zero inflated or not. It's just that it's the most general model. And by using this, we can just kind of like we cover all the other cases um, as, a, as, a, as a either special cases or limiting cases. And then what we do, essentially, we uh, uh, take a local approach in which essentially we assume that the uh, distribution of our gene I, uh, sorry, our, um, uh, our uh, gene S is sort of, uh, uh, can be written as a, as a regression on all the other genes um, of the net of sort of the network that we are estimating. Okay, so essentially, this is a, a, a regression model that in principle uh, explains the expression of our gene S given all of the other genes in the network. And then we will estimate this beta to be zero for some genes. And that would mean that we have an absence of an edge in that particular um, uh, gene pair. So uh, this type of approach to structural learning is not something we invented. It's, it's a kind of a general class of structure learning algorithm, which is called the PC algorithm. And essentially what it does is starts from the complete graph. So assuming that you know, all the genes are connected to all the other genes, and then essentially it tests uh, this null hypothesis that in this case, we actually have two um, sort of regressions in the most general case, because we have both a regression on mu, which is kind of a log linear model, and a regression on pi, which is kind of a logistic model. Um, so we assume our null hypothesis that all of these sort of betas, all of these coefficients of the two regressions for a particular uh, pair of genes S and T are equal to zero. And we test that for essentially each gene pair. And, uh, and we use simply like a deviance test statistic to that. So if the null hypothesis is rejected, then it means there exists an edge between S and T. If the null hypothesis is not rejected, that means that we can sort of remove the edge from the graph. So of course, doing that for every possible pair of genes um, would be kind of too much computationally. And that's kind of like the core of the PC algorithm, which you know, I took this uh, slide from, uh, from this paper here in which they, they sort of present it in general. The idea is, again, with this very simple graph with just four nodes, uh, you start with the simple, so with, the, with the actually most complex graph. So all the edges uh, are present. And essentially, you start with a um, level one or a degree one. So you essentially do, for example, for your uh, node A, you look at the univariate um, regression of A on B, and then on C, and then on D. Okay? And then you basically you will have only one beta to estimate and one beta to test for each of these. And if you um, sort of reject it, then um, you remove the, uh, you keep the edge. If you don't reject it, you remove the edge. And in this case, for example, we can remove, uh, for example, B and C and C and D. Then we move to the degree two, in which we basically regress every node on two neighbors. Uh, in this case, for example, A against B and D. And if we see that one beta is uh, different from zero, then we uh, sort of like uh, we uh, remove one edge and we go on until either we reach a maximum degree that we specify, or we reach like a situation in which we don't uh, remove any more edges. So just to give you some technical remarks that I don't have time to go into this um, in this talk. So we uh, control this neighborhood sites with this parameter M, which is essentially this degree that I just uh, talked about. Um, we prove the consistency of this algorithm, assuming the faithfulness of the node conditional distribution. And we can prove that that exists in the case of competitive relationship between genes. And uh, we have a sort of a, a procedure to estimate the type, uh, to, to control the type one error in the sense of the family wise error rate. And um, one sort of assumption that we make is that there are no latent confounders. So uh, essentially that, you know, all of the relationship that we see among genes, there are no like hidden variables that we didn't, didn't take into account. 
And of course, you can in this framework allow for observed covariates or observed sort of uh, uh, confounders, for example, batch effects. But we don't have a way to kind of deal with hidden batch effects. So just to show you um, quickly uh, some um, some. Do I have ten minutes? Okay. So I'll show you quickly some simulation results. So in this case, um, we simulate with sort of a large mean, meaning that the genes are quite largely uh, highly expressed um, in terms of number of reads. And in this case, everything is as you would imagine. Like if we uh, simulate uh, data from a Poisson, then essentially all the models work well. Um, you know, maybe the, the ZIMB works a little worse. If we assume, uh, if we simulate data with a negative binomial, then the negative binomial also works well, but the Poisson starts failing. And if we assume uh, we simulate from zero inflated negative binomial, we need the zero inflated negative binomial. So this is kind of like a boring uh, simulation result. What is more interesting is that if you now simulate the data with a smaller mean, which is typical of what we observe in, for example, UMI based uh, single cell data, then um, something a little more surprising happens, which is that even when we simulate from a zero inflated negative binomial, even a simple Poisson model works well. Um, and uh, so this sort of like corroborates, I guess, the, the idea that we don't need this sort of like complicated zero inflated models uh, for UMI data, but maybe in a, in a slightly different way that people usually think about that. Um, so just to give you a little more details on that, um, here we're simply um, uh, sort of measuring the Hellinger distance between the two distributions, the negative binomial and the zero inflated negative binomial. Um, at, uh, uh, as a function of pi um, and as a function of the dispersion parameter. Uh, so use, and, and as a mean. <laughs> so you see that when you have a small mean and uh, especially when we have a large uh, variance, uh, we see that even for 90% of zero inflation, so data simulated with pi equal 0 0.9 in the zero inflated negative model, um, the um, the difference between the distance between the two distribution is quite small. So to me, what this means is that when you have small counts, it doesn't really matter what the, the data generating distribution is. A simple model would just work as fine, just because in terms of uh, uh, inferential sense in the distance space, they're very similar. So just uh, in the last five minutes or so, I'll, I'll just uh, give you a, an idea of how to apply this to uh, real data. So uh, the, the case study that, that I have here is by the John Nye lab, who um, you know, many of you know. Um, it's, um, it's about the mouse olfactory epithelium, which is sort of a, a system that we study to kind of, that we use to study sort of, um, uh, you know, how stem cells mature into neurons and other uh, mature cell types. And so this is uh, sort of like a, a simple system that has only a handful of mature cell types. So it's kind of uh, nice to, in that sense, and it has a, a stem cell niche. So essentially what we can observe with single cell data is sort of like all of these uh, sort of different stages of uh, development of uh, these uh, olfactory stem cells that are also called the horizontal basal cells up all the way to uh, neurons. And we have um, sort of like a, a, a few data sets on that. We have uh, the, the latest data that uh, the, the NILAB collected is, is a set of 20,000 plus uh, single cells doing, done with the single uh, with the next genomics technology. Here is a sort of like a heat map of some interesting genes ordered by sort of the pseudo time uh, developmental order from stem cells to neuron. And you can see that there's a, a lot of coordination among genes, like some genes that are um, high in expression early on, some genes that are high later on and some kind of in the middle. And this um, you know, can sort of like be represented quite well with, uh, with sort of uh, graphs. And in particular here, we're focusing on transcription factor genes. And so this is sort of uh, uh, the kind of transcription factor dynamics across development. What we do, we sort of take this uh, uh, stage of uh, olfactory um, uh, stem cells and see like this is just a, a way uh, which is called hive plot to represent a graph with a lot of connection. Otherwise, it looks a lot like a four ball. Um, but essentially, what we do then, we uh, cluster the nodes using some kind of community detection algorithm and run some uh, gene set enrichment analysis on that. And you can see that you know all of these kind of make a lot of sense. So we see a lot of cell cycle and cell differentiation early on in the trajectory. Uh, then we have some uh, signaling and cell proliferation, 
and all the way up to mature neuron where we have chromatin organization and, and sort of uh, signaling uh, pathways starting to pop up. Uh, then we sort of like focus on this, I guess, crucial stage, which is the activated HPCs, which are the stem cells that have been activated and sort of uh, um, uh, the fate is decided that they're gonna um, uh, differentiate. And, um, and if we look more closely to uh, the sets of uh, uh, genes that are sort of uh, connected to this transcription factor T53, we see a lot of uh, uh, sort of genes that uh, we would expect like SOX11, and um, uh, CDH2, et cetera. And uh, in particular, if we focus on the direct neighbors of P63, we see many of the confirmed targets by Chipsy. So we think that our uh, approach is kind of working uh, well in this case. So just to uh, give you a little bit of uh, conclusions and a, a sense of what this is going in terms of development, um, the, um, um, we kind of think that we're on the right track because we are able to kind of give biological insights in this particular data set. We have actually a different uh, uh, data set as well that I didn't have time to present. Uh, but the idea is that now we want to kind of like extend it to include this kind of like pseudo time or space uh, element into it. So kind of like thinking about dynamic networks that, you know, networks that change in, either in pseudo time or in space for spatial transcriptomics. And we can uh, rely on, on, there's a lot of uh, results in the statistical literature for some time, like multivariate time series that we can, we can sort of leverage. And, um, and then of course, the other uh, interesting um, uh, direction is to look at multi-omic data and see if we can sort of like use these sort of market graph or chain graphs to kind of like allow for connections between, for example, chromatin at um, announcer or promoters to inform gene expression. And um, I just want to thank my research group. In particular, this work was done for the most part by Kim, who is a postdoc in my lab, and, um, and, um, and by these two collaborators, Kuhn, that uh, used to be a, a postdoc here at Berkeley, and uh, Monica, who is uh, in Bologna, and of course, uh, the NILAB lab for the data and for the um, good uh, sort of um, back and forth that we had on the on the biological significance of these uh, analysis. So thank you for the attention and everything that I sort of uh, mentioned is in this preprint. And then you can also kind of like try to uh, apply this yourself with this R package that we have on GitHub. Thank you very much, Davide. So are there any questions? That was really nice. One question that comes to mind when thinking about conditional dependency is it is implicitly probing with the PC algorithm, right? Is that you're having uh, sparse measurements, uh, you know, of, of the latent quantities actually induce the conditional dependence. You know, often the variables that actually create independencies might be the, those you measure the least well, as transcription factors right. and other elements. So, so how do you see that in terms of uh, limitations and how to adapt the PC algorithms? Is that already catered for, or is there more work needed? Yeah, no. I mean, I guess uh, there is one key assumption, right? That is that the graph is sparse, right? If the graph is not sparse, then like the PC algorithm is not working well. Um, which is one thing, like sparse in terms of number of edges compared to the full graph, right? Um, but yeah, in the case of like uh, the the main problem is I don't I don't think it's so much with the um, I mean the main problem with the sparsity of the data in terms of expression of genes is that you have to kind of do some kind of filtering based on gene expression, right? If a gene has only like one read in one cell, you're you're not going to be able to get much information about that. And unfortunately, that is true that transcription factors are often uh, lowly expressed. Um, what happens in that case is that you get these sort of spurious um, uh, conditional independences, right? That instead of uh, that, you know, because that node is missing, you have sort of like uh, the, the closest uh, measured node that, that sort of acts as the, uh, the hub node instead of that. So we don't really have a good, um, a good solution to that. But that's what I hope this multi-omic data will be able to kind of like uh, provide us with. Because if we can now use uh, epigenomics data as a kind of like in-between layer. Maybe we have transcription factor has a low expression, but then if we see like a good an answer signal at, uh, at the gene, at the target gene, maybe we can sort of like the hub node, well, the, the, the connection will become the an answer versus or the promoter to the gene expression. And then we can sort of like infer which is the transcription factor that binds there. 
Yeah, thank you. Very nice talk. I just have two questions. The first one is that did you compare your approach, right? You did this direct count modeling approach to this log transform data, and then you can use the Gaussian graphic yeah, model. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, that, that more easier estimation. I guess we had, I, I skipped that slide, yeah. but I have it somewhere here. Um, yeah, so yeah, yeah um, we did a little bit of that. Mm -hmm. um, let's see if I can make this bigger. Um, so yeah, so the log transformation is really bad idea um, in the sense that it works well when you have a very high expression, um, but it's obviously like not really helpful for UMI data when you have very low counts, mm -hmm. right? Um, other approaches like the copula or, the, or, or these uh, randomized quantile residuals, which is very similar, mm -hmm. I guess, to, to the copula in terms of, um, well, I guess it's a different mm -hmm. mechanism to get to what you were doing in terms of like, uh, getting the copula right for non-continuous uh, data. Yeah. So this work well at the uh, sort of like uni univariate uh, level. When you uh, actually look at the, uh, you know, this is simulated data. So, you know, um, uh, but in the case of simulated data, what we see is that um, when you, especially when you have low counts. So here we're simulating with the Poisson. So the kind of like the purple line, which is the Poisson is sort of the ground truth. Uh, when you have low counts, especially, but it seems that if, if you ha have a very large N, then the, the sort of, uh, this is a F1 score of the, of the different models start to kind of degrade. Mm -hmm. And I think the reason for that is that Gaussian graphical models assume Gaussianity. And so when you have very, very large sample size, mm -hmm. even a tiny difference from the null hypothesis will make it. Uh, and so what happens here is that basically we uh, reject all the null hypothesis mm -hmm. uh, when you have N big enough. And these are not like, you know, unusual numbers for single cell data. So that's why we didn't take that approach for now. But yeah, this is sort of also ongoing. So yeah. yeah. Thank you. And my second question is regarding this conditional independence versus like pairwise dependence comparison. So because I think your model can also be used to do just the pairwise relationship between two genes, right? Mm -hmm. It's a different perspective. Like I, I feel like probably for biologists, they want to see how different the results will be and what are the biological implications, the two different graphs. Right, so you, you're mm. meaning instead of conditional independence, like a kind of straight, straight, straight independence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah I mean, there is, there is a literature on like uh, those graphical models for like uh, direct dependencies, yeah. which we could uh, definitely look into. So uh, could I have a question? Uh, when you are talking about uh, the structure learning, you said uh, you have a complete graph. I assuming uh, that graph is a homogeneous graph. Uh, the each node, the node uh, in that graph is all about the genes. So uh, how do we uh, capture all the cells? So all the, so in that complete graph, uh, we'll capture all the cells or just uh, about one cell. Yeah, um, yeah. I, if I understand correctly the question, I think um, you have a good point in the sense that if you have like a heterogeneous set of cells, then um, so essentially our approach assumes that it's a homogeneous population of cells, right? That's uh, another way of saying like there's no latent confounder, right? That there's a, so in this case, what we did, it's a very simplistic approach, which probably is also double dipping. So. Uh, that could be an issue as well, but uh, that we uh, took this sort of uh, clustering of data and its different cell types, and then we uh, estimate the structure of the graph independently for each uh, uh, cluster of cells. Um, that's what I mean here when I say that uh, we want to have this dynamic network sort of try to add that component into the um, algorithm. It's still not the case in this case, so. All right, thanks for all the question and thanks, Davide, again. Thank you.